If you have a New Testament with you, and I trust that you do, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians as we continue our study um, in this letter that the Apostle Paul has written. The Apostle Paul is traveling now in Europe. He's in Greece. He's starting churches. And he has stopped at this crossroads, this important town of Corinth, for 18 months where he's lived and he's worked, where he's built networks and friendships, where he's taught and been rejected, where he's been persecuted for proclaiming Christ, and where, because of the mercies of God, a fledgling church has emerged. And he's left now, and he's traveling further, but he hears word that his friends in Corinth, the people that he's entrusted the church to, well, they've made kind of a mess of things. Because as Paul has left, they have began living life their own way again. They've become distracted by things that took their eyes away from the cross. And, and well, they put it on preachers. They put it on leaders. They put it on, on, on political factions within the church. And, and it was disruptive. So Paul writes them this letter saying, I thank God for you and God's grace in your life and the evidence of that. And I'm disheartened that there's division among you. And I'm disheartened because that division seems to be centered on the very men who are trying to lead you in growing in grace. You're saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Peter. And that is a distraction. And he encourages them in this first chapter to look to the cross. Because the cross, even though it is foolish to everyone else in the world, to those of us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. And God's power is always demonstrating weakness. Look to the cross, what God has chosen to make reconciliation, forgiveness for sin, abundant life in Him possible. It wasn't through high rhetoric. It wasn't through much learning. It was through an instrument of shame and torture and death. And look... He goes on to say that God's power and weakness is demonstrated in you because not many of us were wise or powerful or high-born. He could have picked the winners to make the church happen, but instead he picked the rest of us, the nothings, those of us who are sinful and rebellious and stubborn and broken, those of us who need grace because we have nothing else. He's chosen us to believe in the gospel. To be the church, to make nothing of the wisdom and the power and all the important things in this world. God's doing it his own way. And now as we close out this idea, we turn to the second chapter in verse 1, where Paul writes these words. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, And when I, when I came to you, my brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, For I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. When I came to you, I didn't come with lofty speech, didn't come with wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I want you to see here that Paul, as he writes, says, what is the message? What is the point of all of this? Because the Corinthian church had missed the point. They thought the point was, we like the way Apollos preaches. He sounds like us, he looks like us, he's cultural like us, he's wise like us. He is the model of what we want to be. So let's look to Apollos as the measure of our faith. And some said, no, 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 I'm really impressed with Peter because Peter was close to Jesus. He knew Jesus. He was the chief disciple for three years with Jesus. So I'm looking to him. And they said, some said, no, but Paul is the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles, so I'm looking to Paul. And in all of this, they said, Paul says, no, you've missed the point. You've missed the message. The message is the testimony of God and what he did for us through the cross, through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul says, I've come and I'm sharing this message with you, this gospel with you, this good news with you, not with lofty speech or wisdom. Now, that is important. Because the Corinthian culture is a a Greco-Roman culture, and they valued two things above all else. They valued lofty speech, and that is the idea of rhetoric. In other words, they really loved lawyers. Right? We know, we know how lawyers operate, right? Lawyers come alongside of someone when they're having legal troubles, and dis, dis, without regard to whether or not that person is in the right or the wrong, they passionately advocate for their client. And their client could be as guilty as sin, 
but they are going to make a passionate argument for them. And they're going to try to weave an argument in such a way that a judge or a jury is going to understand that, no, this point of view is the correct one. It has nothing to do with the facts or the truth. It has to do with how well we can argue. That's rhetoric. And they loved rhetoric. It didn't matter whether you were right or wrong. If you were clever in the way that you made an argument, it was convincing. Can I say that 21st century America, we actually value rhetoric. We really do. Because all of our communication are in tweets, 144 characters, nothing more than that. It's all sound bites. I'm listening to political speeches on the evening news, and it all sounds like that's just a sentence followed by a sentence followed by a sentence, and all it is is trying to get somebody to retweet the things that I've said. So it's packaged in these little sound bites. And it doesn't matter whether they're right or they're wrong. If they can be more clever, more cynical, more funny than their opponent, they will win the day. We don't care about the facts. We care about how we argue. So when Paul shows up and his preaching is not up to speed with the rhetoricians of the day, they said, well, Paul doesn't make his arguments as well as our philosophers. So there must be a problem with the gospel. Or if Apollos was a better preacher than Paul, which from the biblical account he probably was, then we need to identify with one of these and reject another. And what's worse, when false apostles, when false teachers came into the church, if they were slick and compelling, they were believed. And Paul says, no, I didn't come with lofty speech or wisdom. The second thing, other than rhetoric, that the Corinthians really valued, they loved, was philosophy. They loved being in Greece, the seat of philosophical wisdom for centuries So they absolutely love the idea of having wisdom, having secret wisdom, having high philosophy. And Paul says, I didn't come slick. I didn't come with all the rhetoric. I didn't come with all the tools. I didn't come with all the cultural trappings that you value. I I set aside lofty speech. I set aside wisdom and proclaimed the testimony of God, the cross, alone. This restates what he said in verse 4, he says, my, In my speech and my message, that is how I said what I said, both my rhetoric and my philosophy were not in plausible words of wisdom, pretty rhetoric or clever philosophy. Paul is saying, I didn't come to you using your culture. I just came with the gospel. And can we just kind of own that, that the problem that was tripping up the Corinthian church is a problem that the American church suffers with as well. When it comes to the gospel, the gospel alone often is never enough. We need the trappings of our culture, the trappings of our society in order to make it plausible. Help me out. If you are over the age of 65, over the age of 65, and kind of grew up in the church here in the South. Are you out there? Can you kind of own that? Okay, that's just several of us. It's fantastic. Has church changed in your lifetime? Can you remember church at 13? Can you remember church at 23? I'm just guessing that this stage looks a little different than it did when you were growing up. What have we added? We had an orchestra. We had an orchestra, and then we didn't have an orchestra like that. So that's interesting that something's come up, and that something's kind of waned a little bit, right? What else has changed? Microphones, right? We didn't have. I would just have to get out there and talk like that. That's why the old Southern Baptist preachers sound like that, right? It's because they didn't have microphones. They had to shout, right? So what else has changed? The words on the screen, right? Everybody turn in your hymn book to page eight fourteen. Do you remember that? And you had to get a book out and thumb through, and that was just. The, For an ADD person, that was just the most confusing thing because I'm like, I don't want to look at that. I want to look at, you know, God of Earth and Outer Space and all the funny hymns that made their way into that book for some reason. Um, What else has changed? Backdrop of the Baptistry, that's changed a bit. What else has changed? Somebody said air conditioning. Oh, my goodness, yes. Anybody anybody baptized in a creek? Oh, wow. Okay, that's that's fun. Um, In July in Albany, I'm just thinking that might be a good idea, right? What else has changed? It's a bigger place, right? The pews. We don't have pews. You're in chairs now. Praise God for chairs that we've gotten rid of pews, right? Cut my teeth on pews, but you probably threw out your back on pews too. Those things are uncomfortable. So things have changed, right? 
as, as our culture has moved from the 18th century to the 19th century to the 20th century, now the 21st, clearly the trappings of how we worship, the things around us have changed. We've kind of kept up with the times. As we, has the style of music changed? Absolutely. We went from singing 19th century um, you know, gospel songs, spiritual songs, to now it's, it's, it's modern, it's different, right? Um, but, but don't miss that, right? In the 19th century, all those songs that we sang for 100 years were new, and there were people going, hey, it's changed for us, right? Uh, the way we worship, that we don't sing Gregorian chant anymore and haven't for a long time, right? So do we see then how culture and worship, culture and the proclamation of the gospel, uh, there, there's an overlap there, that how we do what we do, it changes. And Paul says, look, I didn't come trying to communicate through your culture. I didn't come taking my message of the gospel and trying to make it conform, make it fit the culture. He says, and don't miss this, I decided to know nothing. Now, what we have to understand is when Paul says, I decided not to do the fancy rhetoric or come with the wisdom, the philosophy, he's not saying that he's inadequate. He's not saying that he lacked the ability to come and communicate through using high rhetoric or using sophisticated Greek philosophy. In fact, as Paul's writing this letter, he's using some fairly sophisticated rhetoric in writing this letter. Um, So it's not that he's incapable. In fact, if you mark and look at Acts 22, verse 3, Paul gives a little bit of his pedigree. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Sicilia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. Now, what that means to us is not much, but when Paul made that declaration, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel and learned from him. Paul's saying, look, I had a Harvard education. Gamaliel uh, was the grandson of one of the great rabbis in in Jewish history. Uh, And and Paul's saying, look, I am the spiritual son of someone who is a great man and a great teacher. And the education that I got to that room of other religious, pious people exceeded the education that you got. It would be like us getting together and, and say, I went to Georgia, I went to Florida, I went to FSU, and somebody went, well, I went to Harvard, right? And they're just kind of dropping that nuclear bomb going, you went to state, you, I went to Harvard, and that means something. Paul says, I am educated. I have been trained. I have this skill set to do this kind of high communication. It's not that I'm ignorant or lacking. Paul's saying, I decided I chose. He was making an effort not to present the gospel in a dressed-up package. He was not trying to make the gospel conform to their culture, to make it more palatable for the Corinthian believers. He is making an effort to not impress Corinthian unbelievers with his intellect or his ability. In saying that I have decided to know nothing, Paul is saying, look, I just want to come and share the gospel, and I don't want to trick you. I don't want to manipulate you. I don't want to convince you using anything other than the gospel, the message of the cross of Christ. Why? Because he's already said this foolish message of the cross is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 3, he says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now, what is this weakness, fear, and and trembling stuff all about? Is is Paul scared of the Corinthians? Is it that Paul's coming in and, oh, I've got all these highly educated, sophisticated, metropolitan Corinthians, and I'm scared of what's going to happen? Is Paul afraid of the authorities, that somehow they're going to do harm and injury to him? What's going on? Well, it could mean several things. Paul could be referring to his physical stature or his physical condition. There's a second century account of what Paul looked like, Uh, According to those accounts, Paul was short for his day and age. He was bald. Uh, He had a funny-shaped nose. He was kind of fat. Uh, He wasn't particularly pleasant to look at. Paul was not a good-looking fella, right? So it could be that Paul's saying fear and trembling and weakness, saying, yeah, I know that you guys are all about the rhetoric, which means convincing arguments, and usually that means the tallest guy in the room is going to be a little bit more convincing, and Paul's the short guy, and maybe the guy with a full head of hair is a little bit more appealing, and Paul doesn't have any of that hair. How are you doing, Brian? All right, and we... You're good? You're tracking with me on that? Okay, all right, just making sure. 
So, and it could be that he's not the most handsome guy in the room, and people are going, that Apollos was a tall drink of water, so we're going to listen to him. Could be he's talking about that. 2 Corinthians 10.10 10, uh, says this, Paul says this, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak. This is Paul's critics in Corinth writing about him, that his letters are strong, his letters have weight, but when he shows up, He's not much to look at. And his speech is of no account. So apparently the guy's not a a really impressive public speaker. He could be referring to that. This might be the same thorn in the flesh that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 12. That maybe the thorn in the flesh was his physical appearance, his lack of strong speech. Maybe he was just unappealing in some way. And this is the thorn in the flesh that he prays three times for God to remove. He might have some other physical ailment. Uh, Galatians 4 makes reference to that. And in Galatians 4, 13 and 14, Paul says, You know that it was because of a bodily ailment, and that's the same word for weakness, by the way, used here in 1 Corinthians 2, that I preached the gospel to you at first, and through my condition, though my condition was a trial to you, what does that mean? You did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Could be that Paul is referencing his attitude towards God in light of his ability to accomplish the mission in Corinth. And and I actually think that this idea, more than he's physically unattractive or he's not a good public speaker, I think this is probably where the truth lies. In fact, the reason I say that is from the account of Paul's time in Corinth that we have in Acts 18, which is fascinating. Paul's writing letters to the Corinthians, which we have, And then Luke also writes information to us about what happened with Paul while he was in Corinth. We have that account in Acts 18, chapter 1. It says this, after this, Paul left Athens. And in Athens, this is, can't miss this, Paul goes and he teaches at Mars Hill. And he uses the rhetoric of the day. He uses the culture to try to communicate the gospel. And some believe... Some mock him openly. Athens is the one city that Paul visits that we know he doesn't establish a church, doesn't leave a church remaining when he goes. And the verse says, And he went to Corinth. And after, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade... He stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Uh, Tent makers don't think like Coleman, think giant, right, Uh, caravan kind of tents. Verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. For now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Um, I've got to stop here because I'm a history geek and I love this stuff. Uh, when you go and visit Jerusalem today, there are things there uh, that we can point to from the life of Christ, but they're all below ground, right? Jerusalem's one of those towns where people just built on top of things along the way. Corinth isn't like this. You go to ancient Corinth today, and it's a ruin. It was a city that was abandoned. And, and you can actually go to the place where a later synagogue is found, and you can walk into, it's just stones around you, you can walk into, this is the Jewish synagogue, and there's every reason to believe that that synagogue was there in the first century, that it didn't move places. The building, the stones might be of a later date, but that was where Paul would have gone and taught. No one built over it, no one built around it, it's there. And when it says that when Paul gets kicked out of the synagogue, he goes next door to the house of Titus Justus to teach and preach there, the cool thing is you can go and stand on these stones and say, Paul was teaching and preaching right here. This happened in history. Or this is the synagogue he taught here, or maybe Justice lived next door, it's right here. In fact, we know that one of the treasures of the city, a man named Erastus, comes to faith in Christ, becomes part of the church, 
And you can go put your hand on a stone where Erastus, who was a treasurer in the city in the first century A.D., paid to have a building erected. And he put a stone up saying, I, Erastus, have paid for this out of my own pocket. So you can go to this place and put your hands on it. This is not a story. This is not Aesop. This is not Once Upon a Time. This is not Walt Disney. These things happened in history, in space, in time. We can touch them. They are real People, Sorry, that's a side note for, for your benefit, but I love it. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Verse 9, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. Get this, this is Luke recording what happens to Paul in the book of Acts, verse 9 of chapter 18. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. So Paul says, I came in fear. I came in trembling. I came in weakness. And yet, the Lord himself comes to Paul in a vision while he's in Corinth and says, do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. So Paul has all the tools, everything he could ever want to accomplish the mission of the founding of the church in Corinth. He easily could have cleverly then connected with the crowd. Think about this. He had a fellowship with other believers. He comes to town, doesn't know anybody. Oh, look, here are two people, Aquila and Priscilla. They're believers too. He, he doesn't have a job, a way to pay for his way, but they're tent makers. Paul's a tent maker. He just goes to work for them, plying in his trade. Because they're in town, he has a place to live. He has a job to provide for his living. He has other ministers to help with the work. Silas and Timothy come from Athens and aid him in what's going on. He has a platform for communicating the gospel. First in the synagogue, when he's kicked out of there, the guy who lives next door to the synagogue says, hey, why don't you come preach here? Is that convenient? He has success in ministry with the conversion of people like Crispus. And most importantly, he has a direct revelation from God not to be afraid. Now, if you're afraid of doing something, if you're scared, if you're anxious about engaging uh, with a conversation or, or, or doing something hard, stepping out in faith, and God himself appears to you in a vision and says, hey, you got this. Don't be afraid. Are you afraid any longer? No, you're not. So why is Paul saying, I came in fear? And, and Peter Masters, who's the pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, believes, and I agree with him, that what Paul is saying, what Paul is afraid of, well, he's not afraid of the Corinthians. But he's talking about being afraid for the Corinthians. Because no preacher, no communicator, no, no teacher is able to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. And that is turn cold, dead hearts, rebellious hearts, people who are, who are actively against God and unrepented in their sin, into repentant, broken sons and daughters of the Most High who were made alive in Christ. So I think Paul is saying, look, I was afraid because the work was great, because you were a great city, and you need Jesus. You don't think you need Jesus. You've got rhetoric, you've got philosophy, you've got your stuff, you've got your toys, you've got your job. I don't think you realize your need. So he's afraid. There's fear, there's trembling, there's a weakness. He needs the Holy Spirit to come alongside and do what only God can do in the hearts and the lives of people. I promise you, folks, it is not going to be through clever preaching or great music that people come to this place and become alive in Christ Jesus. We're going to do everything we can to have good music and to have good preaching, but it is only through the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to see lives get transformed here in this church, through this church, it doesn't come with a phone call saying, hey, Danny, could we do just as I am 14 more times? It's going to come with us getting on our knees and saying, Almighty God, would you send your Holy Spirit to work in the lives of people around us? It's not an amen line. It's not. If we want to see the Spirit move, we need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a people who are actively dependent upon God for what only God can do. And as much as I wish that we could put all the trappings of culture in a worship service and grow the church, as if that were the aim, it's not. But as if that were the aim, no, we must be a people of prayer, relying on the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. We need to be a people like Paul, 
who go into this world, into the workplace, into Thanksgiving dinner with our lost family members, in fear, weakness, and much trembling, relying on God, desperate for God to do what only he can do. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and a power, so that your faith, and I want us to underline that, if you're an underliner in your Bible, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Don't miss this. The reason that Paul is thankful to God, chapter 1, for God's grace in their life, the reason that he's concerned that they're uh, fractioning into groups because of the teachers, the reason that he's telling them you need to look to the cross and not anything else, the reason that he says God's power is demonstrated in your weakness by saving you even though you didn't deserve it, is this, so that your faith, Paul's aim, your faith, the why of why he preaches, your faith, the reason we sing songs, your faith, the reason I preach these sermons, your faith, the reason we have small groups, your faith. Are you ready for this? The reason we serve in our community... Your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul does not want them to believe in or believe because of the show. We gather for worship, and we know in the Corinthian church there was problems with the show. We're going to get to that later. We know that one of the reasons they're fractioning to follow Peter, Apollos, Paul, is because of the show. We know that the reason they're following false teachers is because those false teachers are putting all the trappings of their culture around the gospel message so that they can distort the gospel message. Paul does not want them to believe for these reasons. He doesn't want them to be transformed by emotion. He doesn't want them to be converted to a favorite preacher as they were doing. He doesn't want them to be converted to a favorite music style like we often do today. He doesn't want them to be convinced because they were entertained. He doesn't want them to be converted not to the faith of Jesus Christ by faith and an experience or given assurance only in a self-deception. This is one of the reasons that we should not read but in the demonstrating of the Spirit and of power. So let's look at that, verse 5. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of God. Or, I'm sorry, not, that's wrong. Might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Sometimes we read those words and we immediately think Paul is talking about miracles. He's talking about doing these, these great, um, these great um, uh, miracles. He's, he's performing these wonders, showing them these signs. Uh, some of the teachers today are very wont to do that. Paul does perform miracles. This is clear in the New Testament. New Testament apostles perform miracles. It happened. And we would expect true apostles to be able to do that. But for a month now, we've been studying this text, this passage, from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to here. And we know that Paul refers to the power of God in context throughout this chapter. And that Christ is called the power of God. And the wisdom of God. It's the cross that is the power of God through whom we have our reconciliation, our sanctification, our redemption. The power of God Paul is talking about doesn't change from the end of chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2. The power of God is that he has taken wicked, pagan Corinthians and made them alive in Christ. If you need to see signs and wonders to believe Paul, um, if you need... To see signs and wonders. To believe in Jesus. Paul would tell you. As he's telling these Corinthian Christians. That the greatest wonder. Is the only one that counts. The greatest miracle. In our lives that we can see is this. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you. And that you. Are a new creation. Through the gospel. The power of God is just that. It's displayed in weakness, in your weakness. Not that you were good and believe and modify your behavior, but that he is good and saves us in spite of ourselves. So as we wrap up and look at this passage, I think there are four challenges challenges for us today. Four things I just want us to look at, uh, to think about, to contemplate. And, and I just want to say that, that Romans 8.1 is absolutely correct, that there is no condemnation, therefore, for those who are in Christ Jesus, because... 
these four challenges might very well seem like a big bowl of shame that we're about to serve up. That's not it at all. But I think there's a place in our walk with Jesus for healthy introspection. I think there's a place for us to ask hard questions about ourselves and the path that we're on. So remembering there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These are the challenges, I believe, from this passage. Number one, I think we have to ask, are we guilty of making his gospel conform to our culture? I think we're guilty of asking. We we know that we have the gospel. We believe it's the power of God, but we have to dress it up with all of the cultural trappings around us in order for it to have effect in the hearts and lives of other people. You know, James Mishner wrote a pretty scathing novel, historical novel, several years ago called Hawaii. And in that, he tried to tell the story of the colonization of um, the 50th state of the United States, uh, Hawaii. And in that, he is absolutely scathing towards missionaries. Missionaries who would show up and say, we want to take you from your island paganism and make you believe in Jesus. But in order to do that, um, well, we know that all of your buildings are, are open air. They have you know, thatch roofs, and there's no walls, just pillars. But we're going to build churches with walls, but stained glass in the walls. Can you imagine that? You're building a church in Hawaii, and all the beauty around you, you put stained glass to block all that out. And we're going to make you worship in these hot little tiny boxes that have no air called churches. And if you want to come in and worship with us, you have to put shoes on your feet, although the culture never wore shoes, and you have to dress the way we do, even though your culture dresses very differently. You have to look like us and sound like us and walk like us and talk like us before you can believe in the gospel. Praise God for men like William Carey, a century and a half ago, who said we need to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is it is not tethered or tied to our culture. We can go into any culture in this world, present the gospel through the agency of the Holy Spirit. People are going to believe and a church, a healthy church, a doctrinally sound church can emerge and thrive in any culture. The reason we know that is because that's precisely what God has done. Travel the world today and you will find healthy churches in Indonesia, in China, in Africa, in South America that are vibrant and growing and healthy and absolutely sound like their culture and we would be very blind to it. Once upon a time, you would travel the nation, go in any Southern Baptist church from California to Wisconsin to New York to Florida to Birmingham, Alabama, and you would know how people would dress and what kind of songs we would sing and we were a cultural people, right? And people would move south to go north and we would start a Southern Baptist church and after a few years, all those folks would retire and go somewhere else, and that church would struggle and die, and we never knew why. The answer was staring us in our face. We didn't start a church that was indigenous to that culture. We started a cultural church that looked like what we would do here in Albany, Georgia. That doesn't work in Detroit, Michigan. It doesn't work in Boston. It doesn't work in San Francisco. It certainly doesn't work in Indonesia or China. And we all do it. We all take our preferences and our culture and we attach those things to the gospel. Are we guilty of tethering our culture and our gospel together? And is that making it hard for us to communicate the gospel, to carry the gospel outside of our culture, outside of our education bracket, outside of our socioeconomic bracket, outside of our ethnic identity? Is it hard for us then to go to people who are not like us with the gospel? Second challenge. Second question, as we live, worship, and share, is Christ alone enough for us? Or do we, need, do we need other teachings and doctrines? I think this is a danger in the 21st century church in America. I think we say, yes, the gospel, but then we will take teaching and philosophy and thoughts that are not the gospel and tack it on to what Jesus has said. Yes, Jesus is number one. But there are other teachers and other philosophies and other ways of thinking that are a close second. When Paul says it's not about our culture, it's not about other things, it is about Christ and his gospel alone. Do we need stuff to belong to the church? Do we really choose churches based off of how they make us feel? How well we identify with or connect with the style of music or the style of preaching as if the purpose of this is for your edification, maybe even your entertainment alone. In churches in America, there's a nuclear arms race 
It's not just keeping up with the Joneses. Well, they have this, so we need it too. I mean, it is absolutely who can get ahead and have the latest technologies and the biggest toys and and churches are absolutely vying for you. As if you were a consumer and this were Walmart. And they're doing it because we as Christians are responding to it. Can I just say at Gillianville, we are, now look, we have a beautiful facility. We have an amazing gift in what we have. We have capital improvement projects actually coming up that we're going to be doing. We're going to be good stewards of what God has given us, and we're not going to apologize for that. But when it comes to trying to keep up with the Joneses and, and have this nuclear arms race with other churches, we are willing to unilaterally disarm. We are going to cling to the cross of Christ and say it's about his gospel alone. We're going to be good stewards of our resources, good stewards of this campus, do the things that we need to do, but we are not going to try to convince people or win people by hook or crook. We're committed to that. Do we need clever answers before we let people ask the questions? You know, I think that, that we have this mindset that Christ is enough, but in truth we're terrified to have conversations with our coworkers and our friends and our neighbors about our faith Because like the Corinthians, we think we have to have all the clever answers or have to have the clever ways of answering those questions before we'll engage. We're way more comfortable bringing our friends and our coworkers to a pastor because of their education, because they've dealt with some of those tricky questions before, rather than saying, I don't have the education, I don't have the answers, but I have the Holy Spirit. And Paul said he didn't need all that stuff anyway to go to the Corinthians, so I'm just going to go and say, hey, can we talk about the most important thing in my life? And see what the Holy Spirit does with it. Third, hard question. Where does our faith rest? You know, Paul says, um, Paul says in, verse, in verse 5, I, I do this so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's interesting, that word rest is actually just the verb to be. He really is saying in a very literal way, just, just where are you? You're in Jesus, you have faith in Jesus, but where is that faith? Are you really trusting God to be God in your life and to do the things that God promises he's going to do? Or are we putting in our faith in saying we believe in Jesus, saying we have faith in God, but putting it in our own power, in our own understanding, in our own ability to deal with the things that life throws at us? Challenge number four, can we be brave enough to not let God's power be demonstrated in our weakness? Can we be brave enough to let God's power be demonstrated in our weakness? Man, Paul could have preached the lights out in Corinth. It's clever. He had all the tools. He had all the rhetoric. He had all the skills. He had all the knowledge. He had all the answers. And he says, but I decided to put that aside and bring to you only the message of Jesus and trust the Holy Spirit then was going to do the work. Are we afraid to have these conversations about Jesus with people Or can we just be brave enough to go, I don't have the answers, I don't have the knowledge, I'm not clever enough to win somebody over. But it's not about winning somebody over anyway, it's about what the Holy Spirit can do in their life, so I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work. Can we be brave enough to let God's power be demonstrated or weakness? I I think there's a missing virtue in the church, and I would love to see it in my own life more and more, and that is teachability. Can I come to this place? Can I come sit down with you and talk with you and have a cup of coffee with you and say, I don't have all the answers. I haven't got it all together. My family isn't perfect. My life is not um, 100%. My walk with Jesus, there, there are problems from time to time. It's, it can be hard to pray. Sometimes it can be hard to get up and want to read the Word. Sometimes uh, I make mistakes. I road rage from time to time. I need to learn. I need to learn from this book, from your example, from your life experience. Maybe we come here with all the answers ourselves rather than coming here like Paul did with an attitude of surrender and saying, I need to be taught. There are things I still need to learn. Come to church. Come to this place, not with your guard up, with your hands up, saying, Lord, I surrender to you. I'm willing to submit to your word, and I know that my brothers and sisters around me have something to teach. Folks, it's not an accident that you're here. I think you believe that about you, but it's not an accident that the person next to you is here either. And they're not just here for their benefit. They are here for yours. We have things we can learn from each other. Guys, we need to be teachable once again. We need to have the humility to say, I don't know, 
but God does. Let's learn from each other, and let's learn together. And third, can we be brave enough to let God's power be demonstrated in our weakness? Maybe we need to step out in faith to serve or to lead or to serve or to lead in a place in an area that maybe we're scared to, feel inadequate to. And I say that very intentionally. There are places in this church where we definitely need people just to step up and serve. VBS starts tonight. We need people, you know, who are saying, hey, I'm willing to. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I'm willing to serve. We have areas of ministry right now where people are doing two, three, four, five jobs. They're being burned out. Why? Because some of us are afraid to say, uh, I, I'm weak. I'm inadequate. God is strong. He'll provide the grace. I need to serve. There are areas where we need leaders, and some of you guys are so great at humility. You're afraid. You want to serve. You're afraid to lead. To take that, that, that front position, to be at the front of the pack. But in God's kingdom, leadership and service are the same thing. We serve, and that's counted as leadership. When we lead, we can only ever do it by serving others. Lead, serve, lead, serve. Maybe we need to step out in faith and go, yes, Lord Jesus, I'm willing to do anything that is needed in the church, anything you might call me to do, anything that will help us accomplish the mission you've given for us as a faith family. And I know I'm woefully inadequate, but here I am. Paul says, I know nothing but the cross. I've come to you with implausible words. Why? So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And, O oh, church, as we close today, this opening idea and thought in this letter to the Corinthians, that is my prayer for us. That our faith in Christ Jesus would be in Christ Jesus alone. Not faith in Christ Jesus and I like the preaching, not and. Not my faith is in Christ Jesus and I like the music. Not my faith in Christ Jesus and I don't like the music. Not my faith is in Christ Jesus and clever answers. Not my faith is in Christ Jesus and my culture. Not my faith is in Christ Jesus and the way I'm going to vote this November. Not my faith is in Christ Jesus and anything else but in him alone. And when we do that, something beautiful can happen in the church. All the little trappings and things that we fuss about and argue about will disappear and go away. I mean, understand, they're fighting over, I like Danny and I like Roy. That's how this church in Corinth was split up. I like Roy, he's my guy. You're Peter. I like Danny, he's my guy, he's Apollos. And that would have been the age difference too, by the way, between those two guys. So get your head around that one. For us... I like those old hymns. I like the, that new music. Folks, do we argue and fuss about the same ticky-tack stuff they did in the Corinthian church 2,000 years ago? Of course we do. So here's, here's what happens when we say it's Christ alone, it's the gospel alone. Something beautiful happens. Let's just say hypothetically that the young folks over here are saying, you like the new music. Let's just pick on music for a minute. Can we do that? Danny, can I do that? You guys like the new music, Right? Like the Chris Tomlin, like the Lecrae, like the what? Silence. Love it. Okay, thank you, teenagers. All right. What would happen if you guys say, you know what? It's about Jesus and his gospel and not about the music. So I believe that if I bring my friends to this place, that if the gospel is being proclaimed in everything we do, in Sunday school when we teach, when Brian, when he does youth stuff, from my pastor when he's in the pulpit, from the music, regardless of the style, the gospel is being proclaimed. I trust the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of my lost friends that I bring to this place, even though they might not like the music. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the senior adults who might like the older music. Let's say hypothetically that senior adults like older music. Hypothetically. And all the seniors said, there we go. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to absolutely say Romans 12.10 is right, and I'm going to outdo my brothers and sisters in showing honor, and I'm going to say, I don't care about the music. Do what you want to do. We're going to trust the Holy Spirit. And uh, senior adults are going to go, woohoo, all right, so now we get to do old-time religion. But what if, sorry, I don't mean to come over here and say you guys are all senior adults. You're not. You're not. Teresa's looking at me like, oh, you're in trouble. Hypothetically, senior adults. Senior, adu- senior adults, Okay. <laughs> What would happen if you said, I like the old stuff, but it doesn't matter. It's music. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit. 
to work in my life, in my friend's life, and if we have a full-on rock concert going on here with lights and smoke machines, that the Holy Spirit, if I bring my lost friends who are my age to this place, the Holy Spirit can speak in their life because we're sharing the gospel, and that's just stuff. What matters is how the Spirit moves. So I'm going to say I'm letting go of the music. I'm going to Romans 12, 10. Hey, youth, guess what? Don't care about the old-time religion stuff. You have it. You go with it. You outdo them in showing honor. We're going to trust the Holy Spirit to move the lives of people. Oh, my goodness. What happens when we disarm? We say, I don't care about the trapping. don't care about the stuff. We just care about Jesus. And we're going to bring people to the throne and trust the Holy Spirit to do what he does. What happens in a church like that? I will tell you what's going to happen in a church like that. There will be peace in the land. Your pastor will not get any more gray hair. We don't, we don't fuss about music. I'm just using that as a what if. We really don't. And the Holy Spirit will begin to transform lives. We will so not be occupied with our time and our energy and our anxiety with ticky-tack stuff that we give our time and our energy to the things that matter to our lost brothers and sisters, to our lost friends and neighbors, to our lost co-workers, to a city that is desperately in need for the gospel, desperately in need for resources, desperately in need for love. And the Holy Spirit will use this moment, this group, this crowd, this place to transform lives and families and communities and neighborhoods and a city and more. We do all of this not to entertain. This isn't Russell Crowe on the sands of the Colosseum saying, are you entertained? Let's just let go of the culture. Let's just say it's not about that and choose together to know nothing but Christ. Today in a room like this, there are people who don't know Christ. You know the cultural stuff. You're here because you've identified and you like and you love something that's happened, and that's fine. We're going to do everything we do with excellence. We will not apologize for that. Musically, we're going to sound like who we are. We're not apologizing for that. This isn't an agenda. We're not changing anything. I'm just saying you are cultural in your faith, and you don't know Jesus. And you know who you are Let me tell you that cultural Christianity stuff is nothing but a lie. You can meet Jesus this morning. We'll sing a song. You come down, talk to Roy, talk to Brian. We will not embarrass you. We'll take you to the side and show you what God's word says. There are folks that are not belonging to a local church. We stand on this principle that it is biblical. That we as Christians belong to a local church. Church membership is a biblical concept. Don't believe it. Come down. We'll take you to the side. We will show you. There are great churches in this town. There are sister churches in this town. It's a blessing to have fellowship with their pastors. And we just want them all to thrive and to grow and to go. In fact, we need to be praying for our sister churches. By name, we need to be praying for Sherwood because we need a Sherwood in Albany. We need to be praying for Bind because we need a strong Bind in Albany. We need to be praying for First Leesburg and First Albany. We need to be praying for Central. We need to be praying for those churches of like mission and faith. Because guess what? Those pastors are praying for us too. We're disarming. Because we have a city to reach. If you want to be a part of that mission, great churches to belong to, I'm partial to this one.